Hello, I'm Andrew Pearce. This is The Daily Show from The Daily Mail Newsroom. Coming up, there's uproar at Oxford because some students are unhappy that the classics by Virgil, maybe some of the classics by Virgil may be taken off the syllabus. Dame Jenny Murray, the great presenter of Woman's Hour, she's come up with 50 things to do before 50 and she's going to tell us all about it. There's a plague of potholes in England and Wales, more than 500,000. The chance are under huge pressure to do something about it. Should we be raising babies alone? The ongoing row about Caroline Flack, should the Crown Prosecution Service really have pressed ahead with the prosecution when the boyfriend said no? But first, a war of words over Brexit. Yes, Brexit, it's back. Downing Street, in a war of words with the EU negotiators. Does that sound familiar? After Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator, took a Canada-style trade agreement off the table. Number 10, quick to point out, it's exactly the sort of agreement the EU previously said was possible. Now, Michel Barnier says the, the EU will not budge from its insistence on that awful cliche they like using, a level playing field on environmental protections and workers' rights. They say they can't agree to any deal giving the UK free reign to diverge from European standards. Brussels also upped the ante by saying the Elgin marbles, for heaven's sake, have to be returned to Greece as a condition of a free trade deal. The British Museum has already said no way. Joining me now is Emeritus Professor of Accounting at the University of Essex, Prem Sika. Uh, Professor, can you explain in layman's terms what a Canada-style trade deal is? It is generally a deal with uh, which would not apply to everything that is traded, and it would give the uh, UK some autonomy, as Canada has. But of course, Canada is a long way away from the long way away physically from the European Union. Therefore, it has more autonomy, more say, because it also trades with other neighbours like. U.S. and Mexico in a substantial way, whereas the U.K. is uh, obviously part of the European continent. So they don't want to give the U.K. the same autonomy, same in a sense, the watering down of some of the environmental workers and other rights. Well, we don't know that Britain would do that, do we? Um, that's just what Mr. Barnier is saying might happen if they agree to a trade deal, um, because we, if we diverge from European rights, Britain, the British government tell me that some of the things we do now are already more advanced and better than, than the norm in the EU. Uh, well, the government uh, ministers have said that they will not necessarily follow the EU rulings and law at the moment. Our laws are synchronised with the EU, so we are in line with them. Yeah. I don't think we are advanced of them because uh, as members of the EU, we have to be aligned right. as part of a single market. But if we're leaving the European Union, haven't they quite understood, Professor, that actually we want to set our own rules and guidelines and we want to diverge from those? I think the difficulty is if you're going to trade, whether it is with Canada, US or the European Union, there has to be some alignment. There is no com no complete autonomy for any country because, firstly, no country wants its own comp uh, competition and the trading position undermined in, in any way. So they will insist on some alignments and rules. And about 44% of our trade is with the EU, and we have been aligned with it. So, therefore, it's not really surprising that if we want to continue to trade to the same extent with the European Union, then, in a sense, we will have to align with them, and they're a larger block than any of the others. All right. Well, if I can ask you just finally, I mean, I know you can't speak for Michel Barnier, but Downing Street have taken great, taken great pride and pleasure in producing a slide he used in the early negotiations, Michel Barnier, where he said that the EU envisaged doing a Canada-style trade deal. Now that Boris Johnson's re-elected with a huge majority, we're leaving the European Union, he's changed his mind. Why do you think he's changed his view? Well, I think uh, the, posi the position has shifted on the UK side as well. If you remember, Boris Johnson, in an earlier incarnation, never ever envisaged that we would deviate from the alignment with the EU because that was in the best interest of the British businesses. So, in a sense, both parties probably had a, another look at their position and are really restating it. But there's also a game of chess going on, Certainly is. Which, they both, which, which they both want to play to their advantage. All right, that's Prem Seeger. He's Emeritus Professor of Accounting at the University of Essex. Now, do tell your Alexa speaker to play 
Daily Mail News, and you'll get the latest da- newsroom live from Mail Plus. And at five, of course, you hear the latest daily show. <coughs> Now, the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, under great criticism, uh, representatives of the of the family and friends of, of, of Caroline Flack have accused the Crown Prosecution Service of pushing for a show trial, which they say contributed to the suicide of Love Island presenter Caroline Flack. Her boyfriend, who is a former tennis champion, Lewis Burton, has disputed claims from the CPS's account of the night, despite being the one who, report, who reported the assault when the police arrived at her home. In a now previously unpublished social media post shared by her family, she said she'd been suffering from some sort of emotional breakdown for a very long time, and she wrote that she was, quote, not a domestic abuser. The post was written just two weeks prior to her death. She was encouraged not to share it, according to her parents. Joining me now is Dr Charlotte Proudman, who is a human rights barrister. Uh, Dr Proudman, um, the CPS say... Um, uh, the mental state or, or potentially of uh, somebody accused of a crime is not necessarily something they have to take into account. They're very keen to get more victims of, of domestic violence into court so that people who carry out domestic violence are prosecuted. Yes, that's right. I mean, it is unfortunate in my view that the CPS don't take into account mental health more so when it's affecting complainants and also defendants as well, particularly given this case when we know that she was suffering with mental health at the time of the alleged incident. And then, of course, whilst waiting trial, and which subsequently potentially had a significant impact on her taking her own life. So undoubtedly, you know, understanding people's mental health and providing them with welfare is so important within the criminal justice system because the whole process can be incredibly anxiety-inducing, especially when you're waiting, as in uh, Caroline Flack's case, weeks or even months to get a trial date. Do you think, um, however, notwithstanding all of that, Dr Proudman, that um, if the uh, person accused was a 40-year-old male celebrity who'd been accused of... Uh, uh, assaulting his 27-year-old girlfriend, there would be anything like the fuss there has been so far? I mean, look, the CPS, they do get things wrong, um, and we know that. I mean, there has been a story, actually, just today about the CPS defending the move to drop the Nicky Butt assault, Nicky Butt being a footballer, Mm. who you may Mm. recall was Mm. accused of having assaulted his partner, Um, And he said, I believe that that was an accident. And so the CPS, as I understand, dropped that case. And yet within the Caroline Flax case, they obviously, in my view, appeared to want to make an example Mm. out of her. So I think it's right when people say, is this a show trial? Question mark. And I, I think that what we're seeing reported appears to point in the direction that it is. And I say that for two reasons. One, I think that CPS were no doubtedly wanting to make an example Mm. that they're taking cases of domestic abuse seriously. And the way it was reported in the media with the blood on the bed over him, it looked like a serious case of domestic abuse from afar. And I think secondly, of course, this is quite unusual because we have the domestic um, violent complainant being a man and the alleged perpetrator being a woman. So sending out a strong message that they will take these complaints seriously. And no doubt the CPS were worried. You know, if we don't do something about this, if we don't prosecute, then what's going to happen? What will be the fallout? Can I actually just finally, too, um, it occurred to me when I when we started reading about this all the time, her boyfriend did not want to press charges. He's disputed their version of events on that night. Uh, you could argue that um, it was just, a, I don't say just, I'm not underestimating the, the gravity of it, the violence or whatever, but it was a domestic, that's what we would call it, a domestic. And was she really a threat to members of the public? Almost certainly not. Uh, therefore, then, why did they feel the need to take this woman to court? Well, I think, you know, obviously referring to it as a domestic, I don't like to use those types of words because I think it can diminish the impact of domestic violence, which can range from battery assault to actually bodily mm. harm. It can be a serious offence. Sure. So I don't want to diminish the gravity of domestic violence in any way, shape or form. And I do think it's important that we have victimless prosecutions, particularly when we're looking at a pattern of coercive control or serious abuse. However, the case of Caroline Flack appears to me to be an outlier. It doesn't seem to me that this is a woman that needed um, effectively ensuring that the public were protected from her. If anything, um, she needed protecting from herself and that she needed a lot of support. She didn't need locking up. And so I I ask you, what was the public interest in pursuing this, um, given the, the reporting that we've seen subsequently come out? And 
the heartbreaking message that she left shortly before. I appreciate she didn't publish it, but on Instagram, when it shows clearly the CPS prosecution was really one of the main factors that led to her taking her life. All right, that's Dr Charlotte Proudman, who is a human rights barrister. Now, if you enjoy The Daily Show, please subscribe to us, leave us a review on, a, on a Apple Podcasts, Google or Spotify, and get in touch by emailing us at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk or follow us at mailplus. Up next, Oxford University students, some at least, are very cross about removing key texts from the classic syllabus. A proposal has been put forward to take Homer's Iliad and Vir Virgil's, I don't know how to pronounce this, ANA, maybe, optional text on the university's oldest programme to try to modernise the course. Modernising a course that's called the classics, isn't that a contradiction in terms? Now, academics have stressed no decision has yet been taken, but students say these texts are vital to understanding the subject and they've begun petitions to keep the material as a key part of the course syllabus. Joining me now is author, historian and editor of Greek Culture Journal ARG, Daisy Dunn, who's also a graduate of the classics course. Daisy, you will tell me I pronounced it wrong. How do you pronounce it? Well, you were very close. Right. Um, it's Aeneid. Aeneid. Why, yeah. is, why, in your view, is it important that these texts stay on the syllabus? Well, both the Iliad and the Aeneid, as well as the Odyssey, these are the key texts of classics. They're sort of the foundation texts from which so much other literature derives. I think if you think about the Greek tragedies, we were, we were going to see Greek plays in the theatre. They also derive from ideas um, and storylines in these uh, epic works. So it just seems absolutely preposterous to sort of axe these, these key works from um, part of the, the, the syllabus. And, yeah, I find it very difficult to know why anybody at Oxford thinks you need to modernise a course that celebrates the classics. Well, quite. Um, I think at this stage it's very, very difficult to see what they're trying to do or sort of what's really driving uh, this, this decision, which, as you say, hasn't quite been made yet. Um, as far as I can see, it has something to do with trying to open it up to a broader range of people. So very, very few study Greek, for example, at school. Mm. So it <clears> seems <throat> to be trying to sort of make uh, there, there be sort of less emphasis on, on studying Greek texts, for example. But, Greek texts are, but aren't Greek texts the most very important part of the classics? Well, they are. They are. <coughs> but I think um, the point is, I think for years and years, people have been going up to Oxford without really having studied much Greek mm. in the past. And Oxford does a wonderful job of, of teaching you that, that Greek from scratch. Very often you have um, classes, often every single day, to teach you Greek language so that you can read Homer and you can read all these other great works of literature. So it's perfectly capable of getting you up to that standard to be able to read these, these works. So it seems a very, very peculiar um, idea to, to try and take this away from the first part of the course. If I could ask just finally, they say modernise. I'd say, and maybe I'm wrong, they're dumbing it down. Well, it does sound like that, doesn't it? I mean, I think what they're, what they're trying to stress is that they're not deleting these, as it were, from the course. They're trying to put them back. So as it is, you study... Virgil and you study Homer in the first year of the course in preparation for the exam in the second year. What they seem to be saying is that actually you won't start doing that then, but you'll start them in the third and fourth year. So that it's more of a, a process of delaying it. Mm. But then I kind of think that puts you at a disadvantage really when you're trying to study all these other texts. I don't understand how you can really get to grips with those texts without having really absorbed Homer and Virgil from a very early point in the course. So I just I feel like it will set students back rather than put them at an advantage, which seems to be their main criteria for, for doing this. Fascinating. That's Daisy Dunn. She's an author, historian and editor of Greek Culture Journal ARG. Now, coming up, the pothole plague. And do you need a man, hmm, where are we going with this, to have a baby? Apparently not. But first, it's time to find out what's on TV tonight with... Claudia Connell. Thanks, Andrew. The first episode of Tyson Fury, the Gypsy King, went down really well as Fury is such a sort of a big personality with this amazing, colourful life. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. My name is Tyson Luke Fury, and I am the best heavyweight in the world. There's never been a gypsy like Tyson ever. 
Nobody knows the real Tyson. Rocky Velma has nothing on the ticket. And the second episode is on tonight on ITV, and that's not going to disappoint either. In this episode, Fury is celebrating in style after winning a big fight in Vegas, and that gets him into trouble with his wife Paris. And to make amends, he takes the family on holiday to Marbella. I mean, for all their cash and their bling, I mean, I, I loved it last week with Tyson's wife Paris debating whether she should take the, the Ferrari or the roller to the hairdressers. But for all their wealth and all their bling, they actually do come across as a really sort of nice, loving family. And tonight you're going to get to find out who wins the title of Britain's best home cook on BBC One. We all know that the schedules are just awash with cooking programmes and I'm not sure this has particularly merited its place. I mean, last week people were cooking meals with tin tuna and before that they were making omelettes. I mean, it's it's hardly MasterChef, is it? But Mary Berry is one of the judges and it's, it's always really lovely to see her on TV. And, you know, it's not just an excess of cookery shows on TV. There's an overkill of fly-on-the-wall hospital documentaries as well. Hospital, which is filmed at Aintree and the Royal Liverpool University Hospital, is on BBC Two tonight. It's like Armageddon out there. We don't have enough staff, we don't have enough machines and we don't have enough room. It's about half a centimetre away of being dead. All right, mate. It's a huge operation for the patients. It's life or death. Hopefully we will save this patient's life today. The thing is, it does at least give the viewer a chance to see the NHS working at its best. Tonight, a young man is a stab victim and, and he's airlifted to Aintree Hospital and you'll see a 15-strong medical team assembled trying to save his life. Well, thanks very much, Claudia. Now, time for our regular City Update with Ruth Sandlin, business editor at the Daily Mail. Nominated for a top award, I read, too, oh, Ruth. yes, thank you. Very yes, good. In You're... good company with quite a lot of my colleagues. Yes. I think there are 22 of us in yeah, all, is that but, right? but my eyes are drawn straight to you. You're <laughs> well, that's a columnist of the here. year. You say that to all the girls. Probably, oh, you see what I say to the boys. Now, uh, um, can only Lloyd's, imagine. Yeah, Lloyd's <laughs> results, how are they? Not good? Good? Not too good. So, um, Lloyd's are still suffering from... PPI. Now, we all know about PPI. Yeah. We've all had those annoying phone calls. We Some have. of us have even successfully managed to claim back for, for being missold. So this is still going on. Lloyd's have, have said that they've had to pay out another £2.5 in God PPI. Me. So in total, they've paid more than £20 billion. Did anybody ever get get their collar felt for instructing their staff to sell these 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 policies into people's mortgages well, without us all knowing? Because it was almost no, like fraud. I mean, do you know what? It, it is like everything to do with banking scandals. Yeah. You know, you might ask, well, well, has anybody ever really properly been punished for anything? For the banking, and the for banking the bank collapse. And, you know, I mean, I think the most that's really happened is, you know, Fred Goodwin is Lost no longer knighthood. Sir Fred. Yeah, but he's still a very um, rich man. But he's still getting an enormous pension. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's not... And, and, I mean, if you look at Antonio Horta Osorio, by the way, and, and, and by the way, I'm not making comparison or saying he's like Fred. He's not. You know, Antonio has put Lloyd's back together again. He's made it a much safer and stronger bank. Mm. Having said that, he's taken home an awful lot of money, £56 million pounds since 2011. Now, his pay's gone down this year. Oh, poor thing. Um, but he's still got 4.7 million quid. So, How's he you know, cope? it's not too bad. How is he going to cope? We just don't and know. And their figures, what, how much were they down? Was it a third or something? Yeah, so, so the profits are down quite sharply. And they are concerned now as well that the mortgage market is so competitive that that might hit their profitability. Ruth Sunderland, business editor at the Daily Mail. Sports editor Mark Paget's here with the latest. Uh, United, now how much are they offering for Pogba? So Pogba's their star player, allegedly. They paid a record £89 million for him a I couple of years him. ago. I water him. Now they're trying to flog him. Now they want £180 million for him. What? Despite the fact that he's basically been useless for the last couple of years. I didn't now, even know he was still playing for Man United. He's been injured a lot of this right. season as well. So Real Madrid are saying we're the number one suitors for him, but he's been injured and basically useless, so we'll give you £50 million for them. So they're just £130 million apart at the moment. So Martin Samuel argues... Million, I know. I mean, if, they, if they get anywhere near that, he says it should be a statue built of Edward Wood for his negotiation skills. But you, you could build a hospital with that. Absolutely. And the, someone to remember in all this is the man who's been described as a leech, his agent, Mina Raiola, who's not just Mr. 10%, he's close to Mr. 50%. So if anyone's going to mm. get the money up towards 150 million euros or pounds, it's this guy. And they're flogging him because he's useless now. 
He's basically been awful. Been yeah. awful, but, but so awful he'll still go for upwards oh, of 50 shit million. Loads. Yeah. All right, now how did our friend Deontay Wilder get on? <laughs> so that big fight is Saturday night, yeah. Um, and Jeff's taken a different um, taking it today, our man Jeff Powell. He's, he's the legendary Jeff Powell. The legendary Jeff Powell. How long has he been on this paper? Well, decades. Decades. He's already yeah. covered the 66 World Cup final. So that's he's 54 a great, he's a, he's years a great man. Great he's man. a great man. So he's looked at the, what he describes as the top 10 heavyweight punchers of all time, not just heavyweights, mm. but who hits the hardest. Mm. almost he's always been a Mike Tyson man but now he's knocked Tyson down to two put Deontay Wilder this guy Wilder at number one there's one Brit in the top ten Lennox Lewis scrapes in at number ten right and no place for Muhammad Ali really so it's absolutely great debate amongst yeah. fight fans. what about smoking Joe Fraser Smoking Joe Fraser in the top might 10? be in there, but I think George right. Foreman is. I don't think Joe Fraser is as well. So really? it's a great debate. But I think Jeff's arguing concussive power, not really Muhammad yeah. Ali's forte. Yeah. I can but. never really take George Foreman seriously after he produced those <laughs> grills. those grills, <laughs> of which my mother bought me one for Christmas, <laughs> and uh, it was a rather odd thing. I thought this is this great big fourteen million stone boxer, and yeah. it, it, it never it never never quite fitted in with his super it's, heavyweight no, image. Must yeah. have made him lawyer. Now, finally, Eddie mm. Jones is talking about England versus France. England versus Ireland this um, oh, from Ireland. Yeah, this Sunday. Can't get Don't the worry. producers Don't here, worry. I'm afraid. You know. <laughs> so England, Ireland at the weekend. But he got himself into trouble against France a couple of weeks ago when he started talking about brutality and violence and stuff like that. That didn't go down at all well in France right. where they've lost people to uh, deaths in, on the rugby field in recent years oh, really? because of the concussive right. nature of the sport these days. Yeah. So therefore, he's gone totally the other way this week. He's handled all the press conferences himself. He's said nothing. He's been monosyllabic, very prickly not Eddie. good for you and so we no, it's not good for us although we managed to get a bit out of him today right so basically the talking has to stop this weekend England have to win right. otherwise all the talk will turn back to are oh, you a good coach of the England rugby team Eddie and we will nail you down tomorrow Mark on your prediction yeah well I'm going Deontay Wilder wins the boxing and England win the rugby hey you heard it here first that's <laughs> Mark Paget. So do get in touch. You email me at dailyshow at mailplus.co.uk. You follow us at mailplus. Now, forget the coronavirus, the pothole plague. Well, it's already here. New research suggests failure to address Britain's growing pothole problem put motorists, cyclists at risk. They, they're looking for a £5 billion investment by the Chancellor, which was pledged, actually, in the Tory manifesto. How many parties stick to those, of course? Zurich Consultancy has said resistance to solving this issue could result in difficulty keeping traffic running and attribute to the growth of the problem to government funding and council resources to cope with the magnitude of the issue. Joining me now is Rod Dennis from RSC Breakdown. Rod, how many... We've got over half a million potholes. Even if they spend a few billion in the next couple of years, it'll cut the number, but it's never really going get, to get through the backlog, is it? No, you're absolutely right, Andrew. This is the problem we have in this country is that for so long we've allowed our local road network, those that are looked after by local authorities, um, to stagnate. And things have got worse and worse and worse. And now, in many parts of the country, we're almost at breaking point. The estimate really is put at around about £9 billion to actually get our roads up to a decent standard. So £5 billion would be a huge step forward from where we are today. Um, but it still isn't enough, unfortunately, based on a lot of independent estimates out there for what would be really needed uh, to get our roads back to a reasonable how do they actually know, though, Rod, that there are 561,000 potholes? Can you tell me who's counted them? <laughs> so this is this is a very interesting exercise. There's various ways of collecting this information, uh, and it's not, as you might be unsurprised here, it's not an exact science. We've we've done our own estimates on this, looking at the numbers of potholes that have been reported by members of the public, by businesses, but clearly that's a, that's a fraction as well. But the numbers we think here probably come from uh, official figures which councils have for potholes that they know about. But the fact is there are also also an awful lot of them out there which councils don't know about because nobody actually ends up reporting them, and councils don't, don't councils don't pick up on them as part. Are their normal sort of maintenance regime. So, uh, you know, I think most, most drivers listening are probably going to be aware that you know, potholes, depending on where, sure. where you are in the country, is still a massive issue. And, and Rod, on, seriously as well, and finally, it's not just that um, they can slow traffic down, they can come cause serious damage to cars, enormous yeah. problems to cyclists, and I imagine potholes are responsible for a number of broken bones, if not even potentially fatalities. Yeah, and in fact, there have been cases uh, in London where people have actually, cyclists have actually come off in potholes and, and, and that's resulted in a fatality. So yeah, not fixing these things 
really is a false economy. The problem just gets worse and worse and worse, and something should be done about it. And you're right, in terms of car damage, it's significant as well. Distorted suspension springs, wheels, these sorts of things, they're all costly and, frankly, unnecessary things for us having 2020, which is why at the RAC we've been calling consistently for ring fence funds for these roads. And we hope that uh, by the time the, 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 uh, the budget finally arrives in March, there is some fresh thinking here, which um, starts to get to the root of the problem. All right, that's Rod Dennis from the RAC Breakdown. Well, do you ever feel you've missed out on life? Because uh, the journalist Jenny Murray, she's written a list of things she believes people should do before they're 50. Uh, uh, She's now approaching 70. She won't mind me saying that because she's written about that herself. But she believes 50 is a landmark age for a woman. Yesterday, of course, we covered the Sussex School for Girls that's listed all the things girls should do before age five. So should the same logic be applied to women approaching the big 5-0. Joining me now is Jenny Murray. She is, of course, the presenter of BBC's Woman Hour, Woman's Hour. Uh, Dame Jenny Murray, um, what is the most important one on that list of 50? Well, since you just mentioned how old I'm about <laughs> yes. to be, stop lying about your age. <laughs> ah, very good, very good. Did you ever lie about your age? No, I didn't, actually. Uh, I've never seen the point at all Do of you... lying about your age. Um just be truthful about it. So so that's one of the things on the list. Um, do you, what, what ones on the list most interested you? Because this is really designed for women. You said it's for people. Yes. Well, I've, I mean... Really, it's, well, it's I would, female. It's designed for women. Yeah, we've seen... Number, number 28 wouldn't be much use to be. Master the art of the eyeliner for when you're going out or try full schlasses just the once. That wouldn't do much for me. I thought... Well, you never know. You know, you might decide you're going to wear makeup. Well, John Lewis has now got a men's makeup they, they thing. They have. They have, actually. One that you wouldn't want, I think, would be find the perfect bra and buy ten. Oh really? <laughs> when I was when I was um, twenty, my mother sent me to a department store in Cheltenham to buy because she'd found the perfect bra. She she's not with us now, sadly. She was a woman of large bust, and I had to buy fourteen of them. Jenny, can you imagine the eyebrows that were arching in that store? How old did you say you were? I was nineteen. <sighs> Oh, my goodness. Yeah, they, and they just kept thinking, what on earth does that skinny teenager who was spotty, <laughs> I was on my first local paper in those days, what is he doing with 14 bras for a heavy-built woman? But that's a distraction. I thought the really lovely one, though, was number one on your list, Jenny, fall in love and try to stay there. Yeah, the operative word being try, you yes. see. Um, yes, everyone should should do that and try to stick with it if they possibly can but then of course the second one very interesting if mr right turns out to be mr wrong walk away um and then number three was equally walk away from mr he'll do because he won't so the idea is to fall in love and hopefully stick with it but you know if it's not right just make sure that you have a secret bank account yes i like Um, that and you have a job, so, you know, you do have some money because money is what gives you the freedom to walk away if you have to. Is there any on that fit list of 50 that you haven't done? Um, no, actually. Have you learnt to dance for fitness and fun? Well, I learnt to dance. Uh, whether I do much fitness and fun these days is debatable, but I could do if I needed to. Um, the only one that I don't really think i can say i did was love sport oh with Um, you on that you know i'd much rather get fit on the dance floor um than doing any form of sport i am i am just averse to any kind of sport but you know some some women might like it the dog the dogs are very important you know i say get a dog for unconditional love and a guaranteed cheery welcome home very nice. And, and can I ask you just finally, you're now nearer 70 than 50. Does life begin at 70 or does life begin at 50 or does it begin whenever you decide? It just goes on until it doesn't anymore. <laughs> All right. That's J- Jenny Murray, the legendary presenter of BBC Radio 4's Woman's Hour.
Now, new data shows a 360% increase in fertility treatment cycles on single women. That's in the last 10 years. This is rises over 600% if you include those using donor samples without the full IVF treatment. Now, this huge increase in demand has created a massive fertility industry. It's worth over 300 million. What does it mean for the NHS? In 2011, London Health Chiefs created a policy to only fund fertility treatment treatment for couples living in what they says are a stable relationship so saying single women having children would place a greater burden on society joining me now is social infertility coach mel johnson mel johnson what is a social infertility coach it is basically i coach women who are nervous that they're going to miss out on motherhood because of their age um, and their single status. So they haven't got a partner. They're maybe in their mid to late 30s and they're worried that they'll miss out, which was now being called social infertility. And and how are there in, so many women, of course, much more so than when I was growing up, um, are involved in their careers. Um, do some of these women, do you think, think perhaps they should have thought about children earlier um, rather than the career or not? I think there's, there's a real mixture, but a real theme that's coming through is um, they just couldn't meet the right partner. Right. So um, I think a lot of people feel quite frustrated that, it, they, that people think they're putting their career first. People are taking career opportunities for sure, but the real problem is meeting someone to do this with. Yeah. And do you, what, what do you say to those women then who say um, ha single women having a child is going to put a greater burden on society? Well, how do you how do you answer that with your the, the people you coach? Um, I mean, it, again, it completely depends on personal circumstances, but most of the women I coach are absolutely financially sound in their own right. So they've got good careers. They've got money. They're not taking benefits. They're not, you know, they aren't being a, a burden to society. So, um, you know, if you're choosing to do this and you have the financial means to do this, um, that's not bringing a burden to society. And for some of these women who go down this route, whether it's fertility treatment, how much might it cost them, Mel, on average, to have that baby? <laughs> I mean, uh, it, there's a massive variation because it depends on the treatment and uh, a, a load of things. It can start from sort of 1,500. It can go up into the tens of thousands, honestly, depending can on how really? many rounds you need. Yeah. And I suppose for some, they ne they never it never works anyway. Exactly. It's um, particularly if you've been waiting to meet someone, you've left it a bit later. Age maybe isn't on your side for your fertility, so you, you have to go into it knowing it's not a guarantee. It might not work. And just finally, very briefly, do you say to women, is there is an age by which you've really got to uh, decide, you've got to get on with this to have the baby? Is there an age cut off for you or not? No, I mean, there's not an age cut off. I, I'm not a medical person, so they need to get advice really from the clinic on that. 35, the, it starts declining, but there are people in their 40s that are still um, conceiving. All right, that's the social infertility coach, Mel Johnson. I've never spoken to one of those before. Wasn't she nice? That's all we've got time for today. For the latest from the Daily Mail News, we come back every day for briefings at 7am, 12 noon, and, of course, 5pm, where you can listen to me all over again. That's all from me, Andrew Pierce from The Daily Show. I'll be back tomorrow. Have yourselves a great evening and good night.